Hi, it's Rolf Pendall again from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and I'm here to start off week three of Zoning for Equity. In the session today, let me review, uh, start out by reviewing just a few key concepts from last week. If you don't remember any of these, please go back and look at those videos uh, again or read any of the readings that you can't remember. Um, uh, I'm teaming this week with Professor Jason Reese from Ohio State on the roots of zoning, taking us through two eventful, eventful decades uh, in the early history of the planning profession. Uh, I'll set the stage uh, first by talking about the Roaring Twenties when zoning really took off in the United States. Then Professor Reese will discuss why residential zoning in the US differs so much from that in Germany, uh, where it came from, and the Euclid versus Ambler decision. Then I'll be back to talk about the onset of Great Depression in the New Deal, including the start of redlining and the newly formed Homeowners Loan Corporation and the FHA. And finally, Professor Reese will wrap up with a lecture on expulsive zoning with a fascinating complementary supplementary case study of early zoning and redlining uh, in Ohio. So stay tuned and we'll just kick right into it here. Now, there's no doubt that this is gonna be just a reminder for most of you, but it's critical to understand and to give ourselves the context that zoning caught on in the United States during and because of a massive wave of urban growth um, in which in the 19 uh, teens, late teens, the urban population surpassed that of rural uh, America. Um, millions of immigrants were fleeing oppression and religious persecution in Europe from the 1890s to the 1920s. Most of them came through Ellis Island in New York City, as was true of these arrivals in, in um, I think this should be uh, 1915, not 2015. Um, and also over a million Black people fled from violence and economic oppression in the South. Uh, and so that by 1930 alone, the black population had grown by more than 40% in the Northern states. Much of that growth was concentrated in big cities like Chicago, New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Detroit, and Cleveland. The growing population was more productive than ever before as agriculture mechanized with industries producing huge amounts of added value. This led to a big surge in the US gross domestic product from 1920 to 1929. I'll come back to the depression in another minute. The, the millions of these uh, city dwellers at the bottom of the wage, uh, wage uh, pyramid crowded into tenements like these uh, depicted in the, in the Lower East Side of New York City. Uh, the owners of these tenements charged their residents high rents and often didn't maintain their properties very well. And the residents didn't generate enough political clout during this period to force improvements in their own neighborhoods fast enough to keep pace. Um, at, the mean, at the meantime, the wealth uh, that was produced by so many uh, new urban workers was extremely unequally distributed, more so even than today's uh, levels of income inequality, which uh, uh, today are higher than they have been since 1972. Uh, the people at the top, of course, were celebrating um, in high style. The folks who had the incomes to afford it, um, generally better off white families uh, whose fathers were working downtown while the mothers uh, were working in their homes or being supported with domestic servants, uh, opted for the outskirts just as they had been uh, for decades before that. Uh, this development called Ginter Park, which is in Richmond, Virginia, and still stands there today as the picture on the right shows you, was marketed for its appeal to commuters by emphasizing the convenient car service it had, that is the streetcars that many developers would actually pay to extend themselves just so they could sell their lots. But more and more white elites and even members of the middle class could buy cars over this period of time because incomes were rising and car costs were falling. And just for the most famous example, um, when the Model T was introduced by Ford in 1908, it cost the equivalent of what would today be about $22,000. 12 years later in 1920, the cost had dropped to today's equivalent of $3,500. So. Um, only about a fifth of what you'd have to pay uh, or less uh, in, uh, for the same car just 12 years previously. Uh, 
and you have more income to do it with. So obviously, a lot of people are going to get cars, and this is the beginning of the Great Depression. Um, and, and so it's a, a period of fairly uh, fast suburbanization, not only based on streetcars, but also based on private cars. Black people who moved to cities, including Richmond, also included some better off families who could move to suburbs during the 1920s, but the culture of uh, and climate of white supremacy and Jim Crow segregation meant that they were often moving to suburban communities that were designed for and marketed to them. Like the early white streetcar suburbs, this one in Richmond was marketed featuring its transit accessibility, as you can see that it's uh, uh, marketed on the Seven Pines car line. Um, these new suburban black neighborhoods were often distant from those like Ginter Park, which I showed you a minute ago. This practice of creating black suburbs at the urban fringe, um, but beyond and uh, in, in very different parts of the metro area uh, than the white suburbs were built in, uh, set the stage for segregation at the scale of entire metropolitan uh, areas today, especially throughout the South, uh, not just the individual neighborhoods within cities. In some urban areas, including Cleveland, black families saw advertising in black owned newspapers for lots at the rural edge of suburbia, like this one in Chagrin Falls Park, um, Ohio. Some workers could carpool to their jobs in Cleveland and its industrial suburbs. Others remained at home taking care of families and raising produce and animals for their own consumption, sale, or barter. Um, this is advertised as the garden part, the garden spot of this county. Um, the low density and semi-rural character plus anti-Black racism reduced investment in sewer, water, schools, and roads compared with uh, that in white suburbs like Chagrin Falls. In the Northeast and Midwest, suburbanization meant the creation of new municipalities with their own elected officials, tax rates, and school districts. Here's an example from Chicago and Cook County. In 1830, when Chicago was founded, it was just a tiny settlement at the edge of the Great Lakes. It had fewer than 5,000 residents at the time. By 1900, it was the second largest city in the United States. It had over 1.6 million residents. Most of that urban expansion happened through annexation during the 1800s. So that meant that the people who lived in the outskirts were really part of the same uh, base of cities, uh, of uh, elected officials, of ward bosses, of the mayor. They paid tax rates to the same fiscal entity. Uh, but then just 30 years later, at the ed edge of the uh, Great Depression, the city had pretty much stopped expanding while its population kept growing. Uh, by this time, the population um, of the city was 3.3 million. Meanwhile, it was encircled increasingly by incorporated suburbs with plenty of room to grow. Uh, outside Chicago, the whole of Cook County uh, had only about 700,000 residents or 15% of the county's population even though they occupied a much larger share um, of, the, um, of the land area than just 15% of the land in the county. With rising income and an increased sur suburbanization, municipal spending nearly doubled in real per capita terms between the end of World War I and 1932. Uh, so these new cities uh, and expanding cities are spending a lot more on their urban services because these new uh, um, urban residents wanted more and better of them, not just because there's more of them. Um, I believe this is just a current expenditure graph on the, on the left, meaning it doesn't account for borrowing, which also increased dramatically in the 1920s, especially for roads and schools. Municipal bonds offered a reliable rate of return for investors who were also attracted to those uh, bonds, not just because of the stability, but because they were exempt from the national income tax that was adopted by constitutional amendment in 1913. Many of the states took a hands-off attitude to local borrowing, although this varied a lot across the US. With so many new cities competing to attract real estate development, uh, far more infrastructure got built uh, than growth really demanded. In many states, special assessment and local improvement districts also formed during this period with specific purposes for borrowing for infrastructure improvements for one or another kind of infrastructure. And that multiplied the number of local governments, um, in including in states like this one, Illinois, which has more local governments than any other. <clears throat> 
Together, these factors led to massive increases in speculative subdivision around the United States. Um, Florida remains the most famous case um, even today uh, because of the magnitude of its fantastic real estate, real estate development schemes like Aladdin City, uh, southwest of Miami, which uh, was never really built out. These fantasies of legendary new communities didn't seem quite as fantastic in Detroit, uh, which was uh, had a booming economy and, and really nowhere to go but up, it, it seemed. Municipal and township officials allowed the platting of over 90,000 uh, acres of suburban land in the 1920s and, and 1930s. So that's 10 times the amount of platted land in 1910. Uh, uh, during a time when the total metropolitan population increased uh, by about threefold. Business frontage was also expanding along many of the formerly rural roads, but these are areas that were often uh, never occupied or occupied only much later uh, with, with buildings. Uh, it's all subdivision. So next, I'd like you to read the very short chapter by Mark Weiss which summarizes his 1987 book, The Rise of the Community Builders. This uh, book is still a central reference about the roots of zoning and subdivision regulation in the United States. And after that, as you see in the run of show for today, please uh, complete the quiz on the reading. And here's some things to look for um, on this slide. Uh, I'll be back in a few minutes.